Hi, my name is David Hickson, and I would like to share with you today some information about how to properly mill lumber. By milling, we mean the process of going from rough sawn boards, which might have kinks and warps and, and cup and all kinds of misshapen surfaces and shapes to them. And we wanna mill those down to boards that are nice and straight, have parallel faces and perpendicular edges that we can use then to make our furniture. So often as a woodworker, we're gonna start with what's called rough sawn lumber. Rough sawn lumber is exactly that. It's roughly sawn when it's still wet, and then it's dried, either air dried or kilned, in order to make wood that's dry enough in order to make furniture out of. That drying process is going to introduce flaws into the wood, in addition to the flaws that are there naturally from the tree as well. So we wanna go from these boards that have this very rough surface to boards that we can then use to cut to make our parts for our furniture, such as this table leg, which has nice smooth sides nice square corners, nice parallel faces. Often rough sawn lumber will have different kinds of defects, as I said. For example, even this short piece here, if you'll see on the tabletop, as I set this down on the table, the flat table, this piece wants to rock back and forth. It's got a bit of a twist to it. So one of the things we want to do in the milling, in addition to smoothing our faces, is we want to remove those kinds of defects, such as this twist in the board or it might be a cup which goes across the width of the board, or maybe it's bowed along the length of the board. Those are all things that are gonna prevent us from making nice furniture, so we wanna remove those in the milling process. So I'd like to describe for you the usual sequence, the proper sequence for milling lumber. You're gonna start out with your rough board that is rough on all four sides and uh, may have the defects I described earlier. The first thing you're going to do with that board is you may want to cut it into somewhat shorter lengths in order to do the milling. That means you need to think about where the pieces for your project are gonna come out of the rough sawn boards that you have. But it's often very difficult to mill an eight foot, nine foot or 10 foot long board. And so usually you wanna cut that down to shorter manageable lengths of three, four or five feet or so in order to do your milling. Having said that, you don't want to cut pieces of rough lumber to your final dimensions. You want to leave them as long as you can to do the milling comfortably and then cut them to their final dimensions later after their mill. So that's the first thing is to figure out from your rough lumber where your piece is going to come from and how can you break very long boards into shorter pieces that are more manageable for the milling process. We'll see how that comes into play as we get to the jointing and planing of our rough lumber. The proper sequence for milling is this. You, once you have your boards in a manageable size, you are going to take your rough lumber and you are going to joint one face smooth and flat. That's what the joiner does, is it makes a, a, a perfectly planar and smooth surface out of one face. So you're going to do that first. So you're going to go from the rough so surface to a smoothly plain surface. Once you've done that on one wide face, then you'll do the same thing on one edge. And again, I'll show you on the joiner how you're going to do that. But we're going to, after we plane one face, we're going to plane one edge. That does two things to the edge. First of all, it makes it straight and perfectly planar the way it does the face but it also creates a perfectly 90 degree angle between these two surfaces. And we need that in order to reference the further work we're gonna do on this piece of wood. We have to get to that nice 90 degree surface with two surfaces uh, adjacent to each other in order to move forward. That's all done on the jointer. Once we've done that, then we can use the planer to get our second face smooth and parallel to our first face. So after using the planer, now we have these two surfaces, the two broad faces parallel to each other and they're both smooth. And depending on the operation that you're doing next, you might also mill to close to your final thickness at this point too. If you're using boards for glue up, a panel glue up for a tabletop or something of that sort, you might leave them thicker than your final dimension and then do the glue up and then plane down to your final dimension on the whole top. 
But if these pieces are just going to be cut to make your single pieces out of, you might mill it down to pretty close to your final dimension now and leave maybe just a little extra for sanding or planing at the final smooth planing at the end. But that's all going to be done with the planer. This one edge we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about this fourth edge here. That we can leave alone for now because when we cut our boards on the table saw to our final width, this edge will be removed as waste and we don't really need to worry about jointing or planing that edge at this point. It'll become part of our waste. So again, the steps are we joint one face, then we joint one adjacent edge to get our 90 degree angle and two smooth edges. Then we plane it to the thickness we need. That'll get us third face flat and parallel. And then we're going to move on other steps with the table saw and the miter saw to cut to our final dimensions. So I want to walk you through the basic parts and function of the jointer. Here we have an eight inch jointer. Eight inches refers to the width of the bed here of the jointer. And it also tells you how wide a board you can you can joint on this jointer. If you have a board wider than the width of your your jointer bed, then you may need to cut your board into narrower pieces, joint them and then glue them back together in order to get a wider board. That's often what's done with tabletops and so forth is that you mill up thinner, uh, narrower boards and then glue them together to make a, a wider board. So it's a common technique. It's nice to have a nice wide planer. Obviously a wider planer is more expensive and takes up more room and so forth. A six inch or eight inch planer is pretty typical in most non-professional shops. So here's the planer. These, this is the infeed table. The board comes along here as we, as we do the milling. This is the outfeed table. The outfeed table is really the more important one because that's where we register our wood. That's the, the sort of the reference surface of the tool for our milling. And then we have this surface here. This is the fence, and we'll get into using that in a little bit, but this is the fence. Underneath this guard here is a cutter head. The, the planer has a rotating drum here with teeth on it or blades. And so as we run the board over those teeth, as the drum spins, it's going to cut on the underside of the board and cut it flat and smooth. So that's the basic process is running the board across that cutter head in order to make it smooth. Now, in order to do that safely, we want this guard to be able to swing out of the way for our board, but swing back into place when we're not have something over the cutter head. So this is an important safety piece to make sure that that guard swings back into place on it on its own. We don't want it hanging out here and exposing the cutter head. That's just exposing ourselves to more risk than we need. The second thing you will want for milling on the joiner is generally people want to use a couple of uh, pads or grips in order to move the wood through the joiner. That way your hands are kept a little further from the blade and if something were to slip out of place, you've got a little extra safety margin there and also some nice grip on the board to keep it moving through the, uh, the joiner. So when you're getting ready to joint, you need to look at your lumber. Most rough cut lumber will have some sort of a cup or bow to it. And we want those cupped or bowed surfaces to be downward. We want the concave face, if there is one, to be downward on the end feed table. So this board here, you can see a little bit, it has a little bit of a cup to it. So we want that cup to be downward onto the table. And if it had a bow this direction, we would want that bow downward also. If it has a lot of bow, you may not be able to join it correctly and still end up with the board of the thickness you need. And in that case, you might have to shorten your board in order to not waste too much lumber. But that's a little more of an advanced technique. If that's an issue, uh, we can work on that separately. But assuming your board is reasonably straight, you're going to put the curved faces down on the end feed table. Once we do that, we will run the board across the cutter head here uh, with the machine running, obviously. We're going to run it across and cut this like that to smooth that face. After we do that, we're going to look at it and see, did we hit the whole surface or not? If we didn't hit the whole surface, we may need to do two or three or more passes through the joiner, depending on how its thickness is set, in order to get that full face smooth. But we want to make sure that when we're done with this step, that that whole face has been cut smooth 
by the joiner. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I'll need to turn on the dust collector and the machine, so it's going to get noisy here. Make sure you wear hearing protection. You notice as I was joining this, I tried to, as much as possible, have one continuous smooth motion through the machine. You want to press down with moderate pressure to keep it moving and to keep things from slipping, but you don't want to press down too hard. If you have a board that's got a bit of a, 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 a bow to it, if you press down hard, you'll actually press that bow out of the wood and then after you go through the joiner, it'll spring back again and you'll end up with a board that's still bowed. So you want enough pressure to be able to keep it moving through the machine, but not so much that you actually deform the board uh, and, and don't allow the machine to actually remove any sort of um, bow or cup to the, to the board. As much as you can, a nice, smooth, continuous motion. If you stop or if you lift up and press down again, you're going to find that that's going to make variations in your surface. It won't be a nice smooth surface. You'll find there'll be a little bump or a ridge or a mark or something in it. So as much as you can, you want to kind of walk with the board down the planer. You want a nice wide stance and you want to walk with the board down the, down the joiner in order, to, uh, in order to get a nice continuous smooth surface. Now that we've got our one smooth surface, now we can do our edge. So in order to do our edge, you notice I'm blowing the dust out of here so that the dust doesn't uh, sit under the board and create a problem. We are going to take our newly flat surface. We're going to put that against the fence here. This fence should be at exactly 90 degrees to the bed, okay, the in-feed and out-feed tables. We're going to put this against the fence and hold it against the fence as we run this edge through the cutter head. That's going to straighten and smooth that surface, and it's also going to mimic that 90 degree angle of the fence in order to get our perfectly 90 degree angle here. Now, as you're pushing this through, there's a few things to be aware of. First of all, if your hand is down too low, you run the risk of being down here where the, where the cutter head is. So you want to be, you want your hand to be above the guard. If you're pushing the guard aside with your hand, your hand is too low. Similarly, if you push too high up on a taller board like this, you tend to push it away from the fence and now you've lost your 90 degree. And if that happens in the middle, you're gonna get irregularities on your edge. So you need to push above the guard, but below the bottom edge of the fence here. So you kind of have a pretty narrow range here in which you're gonna hold this against the fence as you move it through. And again, you wanna kind of shuffle your hands down as you go and walk the board through so that you get as continuous a motion as possible. So let's see what that looks like. It only took one pass on this particular board in order to get to the, hit the whole edge and to get it nice and straight. So now after those two processes, joining the face and then joining this edge, I now have two nice smooth surfaces on my board and a nice 90 degree angle between the two of them that I can now move on to my subsequent steps with. Now we're ready to move on to use the planer. The joiner and the planer are really companion machines. They work together to do the various processes in order to mill rough lumber into usable lumber and then subsequent steps also. But note that both of them generate a lot of chips, a lot of sawdust, a huge amount of waste material that comes off of them. So they must be used in conjunction with some form of chip collection or dust collection. 
And certainly in the, in the shop, at the school, and at the guild, these machines need to have dust collection running when you use the machines. And generally, you'll start the dust collection first, then use the machine, and then turn the dust collection off after you're done using the machine. The planer works a little bit upside down from the joiner. The joiner, the cutter head is underneath the board. Here in the planer, most planers, the cutter head is above the board. So what we're going to do is we're going to run our smooth surface down on the bed of the planer, and then the cutting is going to be done on the top by a rotating drum of blades or teeth. They're going to cut on the top of the board and make it smooth. The planer does two important things. It first of all makes a smooth surface and a flat surface. It also makes it parallel to the opposite surface. So that's why it's important to use the joiner first. We want that joiner to get our first side nice and flat and straight because the planer uses that as the reference for making the other side flat and straight. If you run a curved board, say a board that has a bow to it, if you run a board like that through a planer, you're going to get two faces that are parallel to each other, but it's still going to be, it's still going to have a curve to it. You're going to have a flat curved board instead of a flat straight board. So you got to do the flattening first on the joiner and then the planer will get the second side parallel to the first side. So on the planer, we adjust the, the depth of cut with the wheel. Typically it's over here. Sometimes it's a crank on top, depending on the style of planer you have. But on, on these, there's a nice crank here. And you'll notice what happens as I turn this is that it lowers the bed down. So we actually raise and lower the bed up to the cutter head. And the cutter head stays at the same location. So this is going to be our thickness adjustment here. Typically for these stationary planers, one full turn on this is approximately a 16th of an inch change in thickness. And usually when you're planing, you don't want to make more than one turn of change at a time. Just like the joiner, we might need to do multiple passes through here to get to our proper thickness. So we may have to make multiple runs and multiple turns of this, but generally no more than one full turn or less at a time. So here we have our jointed board. It's flat on one face. We jointed the edge, so we're good to go on those two faces. But now we're going to get this side flat and parallel to our first face. So we're going to do that by putting the board through the planer this way. This type of planer will have a bar across here, which is a guide to the maximum thickness you can put in here. If we have this too thin and you're trying to take too much wood off, this is going to run into that bar and not let us do that. So we need to be low enough that the wood will pass below that bar. How far below it? Well, that's a little bit of trial and error, but I think if you start at that bar being roughly an eighth of an inch above the high point on your board, realize it may not be of uniform height across here. This, this board has a cup to it, so it's actually wider here and here than it is in the middle. So I'm checking in the middle. I want about, about an eighth of an inch there for my first pass. A little more is okay, a little less is okay, but an eighth of an inch is a good guy. So we're gonna start with that. We're gonna run this through and, uh, and see, see, what, uh, see what happens. So after my first pass here, I can see that I've gotten the middle of the board flat and straight, but my edges are not yet flat because again, this board had some cup to it. So, so uh, I'm going to have to do more passes in order to get this face completely flat and parallel to the other face. Then I'm going to start looking for the thickness, the proper thickness that I need. With this particular board, I'm going to go down to seven eighths of an inch. So I need some something to measure with, tape measure or uh, uh, your square or whatever, in order to measure the thickness of as I go, in order to keep track of my thickness. I don't want to over uh, plane this and get my board too thin. It, it, it's a lot harder to put wood back on than it is to take it off. So what we're going to do is we're going to first get this flat, and then we're going to start checking our thickness every pass in order to get down to our seven eighths. We're going to sneak up on it. 
So each time we make a pass, we're going to adjust our wheel here to go a little bit thinner and a little bit thinner. As we get within an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch of our final thickness, we're going to change this even less. We might only go a quarter of a turn or an eighth of a turn in order to hit exactly our seven eighths measurement that I'm looking for with this particular board. Your thickness, of course, may be different. Right now, I'm at about 15 sixteenths. So I've only got a sixteenth of an inch more to remove on this board. So I'm just going to do quarter turns here, take passes through, and sneak up on my seven eighths of an inch. This is considered milled now. I have jointed a face, jointed an edge, and planed down the third face to the thickness I need. Again, the thickness you need depends on what you're doing. It might be close to the final dimension of your wood if you're not doing any glue up, or if you're doing a glue up, it'll be thicker than your final dimensions. You'll do the glue up, such as for a tabletop, and then you'll plane the whole tabletop down to the final dimension after it's glued up. So at this point, I'm ready to move on to the next step. Let's say I needed a three inch wide apron out of this. I would now go and make that cut on the table saw and our fourth edge here that's still rough, that would be removed when I make the cut on the table saw. You would never joint, generally speaking, you would never joint both edges of a board. And the reason for that is that the joiner makes it straight and flat, but it makes no reference to what the other face is doing. So if you have a board that tapers down to the end, you'll have a nice smooth straight board that tapers. It will not make it of a uniform width. We get our uniform width with a cut on the table saw. 